Hello and welcome to the Occult London Podcast. This is a new podcast dedicated to exploring magic, mysticism, the Kabbalah, as well as many other topics of interest. This is the eighth episode of a series exploring different concepts in relation to the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. I'm your host, Will, and I will be talking to you about this uh, particular subjects in, in this episode. Uh, as I, I've said before, I'm not an expert. I, I consider myself a, an eternal student, and this is very much a project for us to kind of learn and share ideas together. If you like the podcast, please make sure to visit our website at www.occultlondon.co.uk, where you can subscribe uh, to the show, and uh, so you can never miss one. So let's move on with the show. So in terms of in this particular episode, we'll be looking at the Sephira of Gebura. And before I kind of start with this particular fifth Sephira on the Tree of Life, which is known as Severity and attributed to the planet Mars, I wanted to recite the relevant Orphic Hymn to Mars. So hopefully we can kind of invoke some of those positive energetic aspects of the, of the sphere into tonight's podcast. And it goes like this. Magnanimous, unconquered, boisterous Mars, in darts rejoicing and in bloody wars. Fierce and untamed, whose mighty power can make the strongest walls from their foundations shake. Mortal, destroying king, defiled with gore, pleased with war's dreadful and tumultuous roar. Thee human blood and swords and spears delight, and the dire ruin of mad savage fight. Stay, furious contests and avenging strife, whose works with woe in bitter human life. To lovely Venus and to Bacchus yield, to Ceres give the weapons of the field. Encourage peace to gentle works inclined, and give abundance with benign mind. So the let's talk about the correspondences first. So the, obviously the title of this Sephira is Geburah, which means severity. Uh, the name of God is Elohim Gebor, which is gods of power. Um, the archangel is Kamael, which means he who sees God. The angelic hosts are the Seraphim, which is the fiery serpents. And the astrological correspondence is Madim, which is Mars. The tarot correspondences are the four fives of the pack. The elemental correspondences are fire. And the path text is as follows. The fifth path is called the radical intelligence because it is itself the essence of unity. Uniting itself to understanding which emanates from the primordial depths of wisdom. The magical image is a warrior in full armour, so standing on a, on a red chariot. Um, and some people have actually described this as being a, a, a female as well. So it's, a, it's an actual female warrior. Um, I think both potentially work. Um, symbols of this sphere is obviously the pentagram. Um, and other titles would include things like pachad, which means fear. In terms of the colours, we have absolute, we have orange. Uh, Bria, we have red. Yetziri, we have bright scarlet. And Isaiah, we have red flecked with black. The correspondence in the microcosm is the will in the Ruach, and this would correspondence um, with the shoulder. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the the position of this particular sephira on the Tree of Life, so it's obviously the second sephira below the abyss uh, of Dart. So it, again, it receives the full force of Kesed and sits on the negative pillar below Bina. Um, this sapphire is known as the radical intelligence because it resembles unity, um, uniting itself to Bina. So it's very much focused on form and restriction as part of the works of manifestation. So while Bina is building the forms, Gebura could be said to be kind of breaking them down via the forces of Kesed. Gebura is very similar to Kesed in that, in that it sort of relates its power aspects to the supernal triad rather than the sort of lower parts of the tree. So Kesed is... Its power comes from sort of Bina and Chokhmah, how it's different to Kesed, and it's more of an active adjusting force rather than the more kind of passive rulership aspect of Kesed. This sephir is linked very powerfully to any sort of martial aspects of adjustment, justice, as well as sort of absolute truth of things. And it's also very relevant to the, the phrase where after God has created all things, he looks over his work and sees it is good. Um, Gebura can be seen as purging fire. 
that p purifies and sort of burns away anything that's obsolete and useless. And, you know, we can have a look at this from descending the tree. So it's getting rid of anything that's not worth in order for forms to come into being. And then from ascending the tree, it's kind of purifying force that cleanses so that you can actually climb higher. So it's kind of cleansing and getting away with that stuff that you don't need. Dion Fortune said the following about Gebura. It, Gebura, therefore represents the catabolic or breaking down of force. Catabolism, be it remembered, is that aspect of metabolism or the life process which is combined with the release of force in activity. It has been said that good is that which is constructive, which builds up, and evil is that which is destructive, which breaks down. How false this philosophy is, for we see when we try to classify, according to this principle, a cancer and a disinfectant. In the deeper, more philosophical teachings of the mysteries, we recognise that good and evil are not things in themselves but conditions evil is simply misplaced forced misplaced in time if it is out of date or so far behind of its day as to be impractical misplaced in space if it turns up in the wrong place like the burning coal on the hearth rug or the bath water through the drawing room ceiling misplaced in proportion if an excess of love makes us silly and sentimental or a lack of love makes us cruel and destructive. And that's still on fortune. Chick Chisero um, from the, the Golden Dawn um, also says this in his book, uh, Self-Initiation into the Golden Dawn Tradition. Geburah is without a doubt the least understood and most feared Sephira on the tree of life. However, the natural order of the universe depends upon the concept of opposites in a balance, Thus, the benevolence, mercy, and form-building qualities of Kesed are now equilibrated by the harsh, destructive actions of the fifth sphere. Gebura's duty is to break down the form issued by Kesed and apply discipline in the manner of a purging fire. Any energy that makes its way down the tree of life into the material world must be tested and tempered by the opposites of mercy and severity. It must be cleansed in the fires of Gebura, and all impurities must be burned away, just as the blade of a strong sword must be tested by the fires of a metalsmith's furnace. Only in this way can the energy be fashioned as a sturdy vicle for manifestation. Geburah is the strong arm of God, commanding respect and burning away all that is useless or outmoded. The harsh, destructive action of this sphere is absolutely vital to further evolution. The energy of Gebura is not an evil force, unless its essence spills over from justice to cruelty. Gebura is essentially a conciliatory power, which restricts the merciless love, the merciful love, sorry, of Kesed. Without the powerful force of Gebura, the mercies of Kesed would deteriorate into frivolity and weakness. So what we can see from this is, is similar to what we were talking about with regards to Kesed. So the force of Geburah is absolutely essential in order for kind of manifestation of consciousness to continue. So this is kind of the darkness before the storm. Darkness before the dawn, sorry, the dark night, the soul, um, you know, the dark backbreaking work that has to occur for anything to be created. There's a saying that says anything worth doing will be difficult and... Um, this is highly true of Gebura because it teaches us to kind of be strong and have that resilience to to carry on and push through um, even when we feel kind of fed up and, uh, and sort of ready to give up. Um, <clears throat> in terms of one of the titles, so one of the titles of Bina is the bringer of death um, as she's constantly transmuting force into form um, and there's a link with obviously Bina and Gabur in the same way. So Gabur acts in a similar way to the forces of Kesed by testing and using them to make sure they're strong and uh, obviously breaking down things. <clears throat> so, and um, yeah, I mean, Russ, this is one of the things that we have to kind of think about when we talk about Gabur is that it's very much this handling of difficult aspects of our personality and strengthening. And it's something that we really don't, want to face a lot of the time because it's it's very difficult very painful and it's not something we automatically choose 
Um, Greer, in his excellent book, Paths of Wisdom, has a good quote in relation to this when he says the, the following. Whilst its counterpart on the right side of the tree of life offers space for freedom and creativity, the left-hand pillar teaches harder and more painful lessons about the universe. Evil, suffering, death, pain and misery, all those things we try to avoid and to hate, to think about, have as much of a place in the Kabbalistic magician's universe as any other experience. They happen to everyone, including the most spiritual of people, and they play a significant role in the work of inner development. If life is to be understood, the place of suffering it must be grasped, not ignored or waved aside. So we can see that the you know, this is something that we really need to, to focus on in terms of that breaking down and changing uh, you know, aspects of ourselves for the good. And in this sense, it can be seen as a, as a sacrificial sphere or a sacrificial priest. Um, this is something Dion Fortune mentions when she said the following. The deliberate and open-eyed choice of a greater good in preference to a lesser good, as the athlete prefers the fatigue of exercise to the case of the sloth that puts him out of condition. So it's choosing those hard things um, rather than the easy option that will make us stronger and better magicians. In terms of the God name, so we have uh, Elohim Gibor, which could be translated as God of Battles. Um, this again kind of emphasises the idea that nothing can be can escape the might of the divine the universal law and and also shows us kind of the essence of the sephira's judgment and you know the cure can be as harsh as the illness the archangel is camel who is the archangel of strength courage and war in the sort of christian and jewish traditions he also holds many titles including sort of champion of god fire of god um burner of god and the root carb means pain so it's sort of suffering and the different kind of Geburic aspects from that point of view. Um, one of the old relevant people in regards to this um, is also Satan as well. So he is, has some crossover with the sphere of Geburah. The archangel for this sphere is also meant to have been one of the archangels that expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, um, holding a, a flaming sword. So... He presides over the order of the seraphim, which is the order of angels um, who are said to kind of enter and abide in the most presence of God. And he's in in that sense, he's kind of like the head of the, the, the royal guard or the or potentially like the secret service. Um, the, these are the people that make the difficult decisions and, uh, and will go out there and potentially get rid of something if you're not, uh, if you don't need it or if it's blocking your development. <laughs> Um, also known as the fire of God or the burner of God and he's he's also meant to represent the kind of karmic continuum um, so yeah so he burns away the dross and you know obviously ensures that the initiate can kind of rise to the higher planes the angelic order of this particular sapphira is the fiery serpents which means uh, it's come from the root which is uh, SRP, which means to kind of burn by fire. And again, the seraphim were meant to be placed as a guard before the gates of paradise um, after Adam's exile. So they are kind of associated with heat and that fiery justice that we face. If we look at the gods and goddesses that rule the sphere of Mars, um, we of course encounter a lot of male um, warrior gods. So Thor, Ares, Mars and Horus. However, there's also quite a few female gods and goddesses that are highly relevant. So one of these is Neptis um, in her role as the goddess of death. Um, so she could be seen as kind of a, a, a sort of like a shadow version of the goddess Isis, um, fitting into the kind of light and dark aspects of the goddess in Bina. Um, also Moat in the Canaanite mythology is the goddess of death. Uh, the god of death, sorry, and there's lots of parallels with gods uh, of Gebura and the sacrificed god in Tipperet. Um, one of the stories I quite like, in particularly in relation to this particular Sephira, is the one about Odin on the world tree or Yggdrasil. So um, the story of this 
shows quite a lot about the sort of self-sacrifice and pain aspects of this Sephira. So the story says that at the centre of the universe stands a great tree known as Yggdrasil. At the top of the tree is where Asgard sits, and at the bottom is what is known as the Well of Erd, a deep and dark pool in which sort of you know many of the most powerful forces of the universe dwell and hide. And among those beings um, were things which are known as called the Norns or Three Maidens. And they were essentially responsible for shaping the fate of the universe by carving runes into Yggdrasil's trunk and thus affecting everything in the nine worlds. Odin, um, you know, obviously being the you know the king of the gods, is particularly jealous of these powers, and he wants them for himself. And so, since the runes only reveal themselves to those who prove themselves worthy, um similar to the Grail quests, Odin hangs himself from a branch of the Yggdrasil, so he pierces himself with a spear and, and peers down into the water below, and he essentially goes into kind of a state between living and death. However, at the end of the nine nights, he is granted the knowledge of the runes, and then he says the following, apparently. Then I was fertilised and became wise. I truly grew and thrived. From a word to a word, I was led to a word. From a work to a work, I was led to a work. So in the Havamal text, which is an old Norse poem that kind of compromises, comprises part of the poetic Edda, um, Odin is meant to have described this experience as given to Odin, myself to myself. So... From this point of view, we can see it as, you know, his sacrifice is not to the other gods, but really to himself in that sense. Um, and from a Geburic point of view, we make a sacrifice of, of ourselves to our higher self. So the self that is sacrificed is part of us, but it's not the real self. It's part of the, the transitory self. It's the stuff that we don't need, but we like to hang on to. Uh, and it's extremely painful to to get rid of it. So that um, brings us to the end of this week's podcast. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Please make sure to visit our website at www.ocoplondon.co.uk where you can subscribe and then you can never miss a show and you can also join our Facebook group as well. And um, hope to speak to you soon. Thanks and goodbye.